Welcome back to This Week. Bob is on vacation. I'm joined by a panel of experts, as always, Jerry Maynard, Metro Councilman at Large. Congratulations on your Thank recent you. election. Appreciate that. And also syndicated radio talk show host, Steve Gill. Steve, congratulations on whatever your alma, <laughs> your alma mater not being hammered by the NCAA in football. I don't know. The, the dark cloud of the NCAA has been removed from us basketball removed. and football. And before we've won a game, we've won this season. Yeah, right. yeah. Congratulations on being undefeated, I guess, and so At forth in, in August. Uh, gentlemen, let's talk about a serious uh, subject earlier this week. Adolfo A. Birch, Supreme Court Justice in Tennessee from 1983 to 2006, first African-American appointed by uh, Ned McWhorter. Uh, the significance, he passed away earlier this week, the significance of, of his run and his tenure, of course, the courthouse named the Birch right. Building. You know, I would not have come to Nashville but for Justice A.A. A. Birch. Uh, Richard Manson, oh. I was interviewing for a job, and Richard Manson said to me uh, when I was practicing law, he says, you know, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is an African American. And what that said to me is that, that you can achieve anything in Tennessee if you work hard, put your nose to the grind. It, it was a living testimony that you can do anything in this great state, in this great city. And to have an African American as the Chief Justice of your Supreme Court for the entire state spoke volumes of one opportunity and that you could be successful I had a job offer in Atlanta and I chose between Atlanta and Nashville and I came to Nashville I did not know Avon Williams I did not know Z Alexander Luby but I sure did know Justice A. A. Birch he is my hero and um, a dear friend and a mentor the Chief Justice used to call me and he would hear things about me and he would like Jerry young man I heard blah 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 here's a Chief Justice calling a little lawyer correcting me and saying you represent us and you, you, you there's a there's a standard that you have to keep and so it just meant so much just to hear even though he was correcting me it meant so much that he cared enough to call that's a great story. Yeah, yeah Thurgood Marshall was the first African American justice on the U.S. Supreme Court, and A. A. Birch was the Thurgood Marshall of Tennessee, yeah. and he was was that kind of icon. And you know, and even as a young baby lawyer myself, as a young white lawyer, names like Luby and, and, and Avon Williams, and, and I think for even countless uh, white lawyers, uh, uh, A. A. Birch are, are folks that that even white lawyers had immense respect for. Not just because of of the barriers they were breaking, but because they were they were guys that would kick your butt if you didn't watch <laughs> out in a courtroom. So you you had to be on your A game. They were good lawyers. A great loss and a great legacy, yes. A. A. Birch. A little bit about the Amazon.com deal. Uh, governor Haslam is going to honor what uh, former Governor Bredesen had, had uh, cut the deal with Amazon.com, that they could bring distribution centers to Tennessee, not charge sales tax. Uh, the brick and mortar businesses are up in arms, a lot of small businesses, because they feel like they're right away at a 10%, almost 10% disadvantage. I want to roll a, a clip by uh, Congressman Jim Cooper in his thoughts on this deal. Roll. Uh, you want to make sure the brick and mortar businesses have a chance to survive in the internet world because uh, you can't just do everything in a virtual world. You also want a governor that honors the promises made even by his predecessor. So how do you get all this figured out? Probably the promise shouldn't have been made to start with, but somebody made it and I forget now who. And This is really a state issue, but it's the example, you know, it's uh, the world isn't all black and white. It is such a sticky wicket to go down because a Democratic governor made the promise. The Republican governor says, yes, this is what we're going to do. And he says he's still working on a plan. What would that plan be? Well, I think part of the plan is what happens down the line. How long is the deal going to be where they don't have to collect the sales tax? But you've seen Amazon pick up and leave other states when they've said, look, we're not going to pay the sales tax here because if we're in another state, we wouldn't be paying the sales tax here. We'd still be competing with your brick and mortar businesses. And they've picked up and gone elsewhere before. If Amazon was locating in North Carolina instead of in Tennessee, North Carolina would get those 1,200 or so jobs. We would still not collect the sales tax. Our businesses would still have to compete online. So in some ways, this is a beyond border issue. Tennessee's just having to confront it in this case. And again, it's, it's a hard call. Do you accept the jobs? and not the taxes, or do you have the jobs go somewhere else and still not collect the taxes? And I think that Jim Cooper raised the point, will we lose jobs from the existing companies that are already here because they're not competitive with Amazon? <clears throat> I'm not sure I buy that. I'm, I kind of agree with Steve. I think for the first time since we've been doing this, I agree with Steve that you want to bring the jobs here. That's what we're hurting for. We need those jobs, and whether we collect the sales tax or not, I think is not as important as bringing those 1,200 jobs that are guaranteed. We don't know whether we'll have an economic impact on the brick and mortar existing uh, businesses right now, but we do know we lose those 1,200 jobs. Let's get those jobs in, and we don't have to give them all these sweet hard deals. So I think that we should go ahead and bring Amazon here and, and create those jobs. And, and part of the challenge is, is looking at a global economy down the road where you're going to have more internet, you're going to have more purchases like that, but also that personal contact 
in business is becoming more and more important because there's less and less of that. We've got a client that we're working with that has made a ton of money in online sales over time. They're now actually moving their focus to their brick and mortar operation because you've got folks online that'll pick between two different companies based on 10 cents difference. Right. And, and so you've got people going in, trying on clothes and boots and shoes in a store and then ordering it online to save $5. So that personal contact is becoming more important. They're actually shifting more of their attention to the bricks and mortar where they have that personal contact. Maybe we see more of that down the line. All right, we will keep an eye on that. Now, you talk about agreeing. I promise you this next subject, you will be divided. <laughs> I want to set the scene, though. Have some fun here. Art imitating life. This is a clip from the TV show West Wing. This is a presidential debate. Jeb Bartlett, the incumbent, is taking on a Republican played by James Brolin, which is a huge stretch because he's married to Barbara Streisand. Uh, but it's talking, he had just had a, a comment about how less government, states control states' power, and this is Governor Bar uh, President Bartlett's response to that in the presidential debate. Roll. You think states should do the governing wall to wall. That's a perfectly valid opinion. But your state of Florida got $12.6 billion in federal money last year from Nebraskans and Virginians and New Yorkers and Alaskans with their Eskimo poetry. 12.6 out of a state budget of 50 billion. I'm supposed to be using this time for a question, so here it is. Can we have it back, please? Very much. Well, there you go. That leads me to all the Republican candidates for president to a person have taken federal money. It's been documented that uh, for the Salt Lake City Games, um, uh, Mitt Romney uh, campaigned for or lobbied for $1.3 billion, $1.2 billion for Rick Perry in Texas and Medicare when they needed to get to have somewhat of a bailout in 2003. How can a, an American voter square in their head if they're voting Republican on which candidate? Less government, but oh, I have it on my resume, I've taken money from the federal government. Steve? Well, first of all, I would say to correct you, there is no federal money. There is our money as taxpayers that we send to Washington, then they dribble part of it back after they take a pretty huge covering cost for it going there and coming back to us. In a lot of these states, if they would stay out of our business, off our back and out of our pockets, we'd do better without sending it there and having it come back. Just this week, we were talking about a story where in Nevada, part of the stimulus plan, we sent $500,000 as part of the stimulus to plant trees. They planted 2,000 trees at a cost of $250 a piece. They created 1.72 jobs with that half million dollars. I'm confident that whether it's Florida on that show or Tennessee here, we can spend our money a little better than uh, $500,000, $250 a tree when you can go on the Arbor Day Foundation website and buy them for four bucks a piece. Now Steve uses it as an extreme example. Well, let me tell you about the real deal here in Nashville. We would have had to lay off teachers. We would have had to lay off firefighters. We would have had to lay off uh, our Metro police officers, and we would have had to lay off uh, anywhere from 100 to 200 Metro employees had it not been for the stimulus package money. Here's the thing that's so important, is that when Republicans voted against the stimulus package, you know what they did after they voted no against it? They then went back and said, can you bring some of that money to my district and help create some jobs here? To a person, every Republican who voted no, then accepted the money in their district. And we accepted that money because we needed that money. And it is federal dollars. Yes, we send money up, but the money then comes back down to us through the state to local government. As a local government official, we needed that stimulus package money. If not, we would have laid off the police, teachers and firefighters. We had police, teachers and firefighters three years ago before we borrowed a trillion dollars a year from the Chinese to send it to Nashville. We were paving roads, we were educating kids. This was just a government boondoggle and the waste and fraud and abuse in it is out of control. It's not worth the money we got back. We can go back and forth here. I do want to ask you because we're running out of time. A few weeks ago, Michelle Bachman wins the straw poll of uh, high uh, in all the polls. Rick Perry comes in. She's on a milk carton. What's going on? Um, I would say go back four years ago at this stage of the game, President Hillary Clinton couldn't lose. <laughs> then there was a guy named Barack Obama who came out of nowhere. This is a fluid deal. It's going to change a lot. We still may see Sarah Palin. One answer. Rick Perry's crazier than Michelle Bachman. So the Republicans are trying to nominate the most craziest person they can. Rick's crazier. Three-time right. governor of Texas. People <laughs> of Texas have liked him pretty Read well. Read his book. <laughs> 20 seconds. Uh, Pat Summit, your reaction. Uh, classy, classy lady. I'm happy to wear an orange tie in her support today. I actually was a grad assistant, helped work the uh, men's practice team for her. Thank God I played for the men's team there because I wasn't man enough to play for her. <laughs> I'm sympathetic to dementia because she's going to kick its butt. Yeah. Good deal. Jerry, thank you. Steve, thank you for your thank time. You. Good stuff as always. We'll be right back on this one.